A group of high school kids get themselves into and out of various high-tech predicaments and solve complex mysteries with the aid of their trusty personal computers and the art of hacking. But this isn't the movie Hackers or War Games though, this is an overlooked early 80s TV gem known as WizKids. WizKids originally aired on the US network CBS from October 5th, 1983 through to the series finale that aired on June 2nd in the summer of 1984. The show only ran for 18 episodes, it was cancelled after only one season. WizKids was created by Philip Daguerre, who had also created the popular private detective series Simon and Simon for CBS in 1981, and Bob Shane, who had written for Simon and Simon as well as other classic detective shows like Remington Steele, Murder She Wrote, and Spencer for Hire. Philip Daguerre also served as executive producer. WizKids was produced by Universal Television. Philip Daguerre stated in several 1983 interviews that he conceived of WizKids after recognizing the importance of computers in his work as a television producer and believed this new technology could make an interesting premise for a series. The notion of teenage computer geniuses hacking into computers was often compared to, and thought by many to have been inspired by, the film War Games, which had been released in May 1983 and became a hit during that summer. However, Daguerre has repeatedly stated that his idea for the show was originally conceived of in 1981. If you think about the length of time it takes to write, cast and film a TV show, it is really unlikely that WizKids was copied as a concept from War Games. In 1983 it was estimated there were 10 million computers in use in the US. WizKids was created at a time when people could not not help noticing the growing importance of computers and the increasing influence computing was having on all aspects of society. It makes sense, given events in the US around this time, that we will get to in a minute, that convergent creative processes took notice of cheaper, more accessible personal computers and the rapidly emerging phenomenon of teen hackers. A year before WizKids came out, the movie Tron had proven that kids were interested in complex plots that revolved around computers. WizKids would test just how great that interest was. The plot of the show revolves around Richie Adler, played by real-life 80s video game champion Matthew Laborteau, a 10th grader who lives with his mother Irene, played by Madeleine Kane, and younger sister Cheryl, played by Melanie Gaffin. Richie's mother and father are divorced, and his father works overseas as a senior telecommunications engineer. His father salvages obsolete computers and computer parts and sends them to Richie. Richie uses those parts to put together Ralph, his bedroom side computer that can do facial recognition, understand vocal commands, and speaks with its own actually synthesized voice. Ralph is an important character in its own right within the show, and features heavily as people make demands on Richie for Ralph's computing power. In some episodes, Ralph is even seized by federal agents. Oh no. Would you like some popcorn? I'll get it! Stay right where you are. Don't call out. Don't try to warn anyone else in the house. Who are you? Federal Bureau of Investigation. This is official government business. We have arrest warrants and a search warrant. Oh, no, Richie. We're with the FBI. I'm afraid all four of you are under arrest. Whose computer is this? It's mine. And your? Richie Adler. Right. Come on, kids, let's go. Seize the computer, all magnetic media, any hard copy, manuals, notes, take everything. In reality, though, they probably would have seized anything in the house that had a plug. Anyway, Richie and his group of high school friends, Hamilton, Ham Parker, played by Todd Porter, Jeremy Saldino, played by Jeffrey Jacquet, and Alice Tyler, played by Andrea Elson, find themselves faced with numerous mysteries to solve but very specifically the kind of mysteries that can be picked apart with the aid of computer skills and the occasional theft of a car or late night visit to a cemetery. We're getting ahead of ourselves a bit though. WizKids really leans into white collar crime, national security and hacking related storylines. To give you an idea of just how much, this promotion for the show should give you some insight. Wednesday on WizKids, Richie's accused of embezzlement. Richie Adler stole the money after all. Sending Farley and friends out to catch the real culprit. In keeping with this theme, the show's antagonists are often tech-savvy criminals, murderous corporate executives, or dangerous deep cover Cold War spies. Joining the kids from episode two onwards are Llewellyn Farley, played by Max Gale, a reporter for the fictional newspaper The LA Gazette, who writes exposés of crime and corruption, and Lieutenant Neil Quinn, played by A. Martinez, who is head of a local detective unit. These characters were added to the show after some significant criticisms of the pilot episode, which many prominent TV critics at the time believed glorified or at least actively encouraged hacking by youths. In most episodes, the kids, their reporter friend, and the police lieutenant find themselves in an often awkward alliance to solve crimes, with the reporter and cop providing the kids with legitimate means to access information that they might have otherwise had to gain access to through hacking, and with moral guidance on how to go about solving mysteries within the confines of the law. 
To give an idea of what I think is the purest expression of the themes and plot lines WizKids tackles, we're going to briefly go over the plot of the pilot episode, Programmed for Murder. Speaking of themes, I should also point out the show's actual theme song, which is composed by Paul Seiko Chihara at this point, as you'll have already heard it in the background of this video. It's a jaunty synthesizer rendition of Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 21 in C major. This and synthesizer versions of other classical music feature throughout the show's run, sometimes wildly at odds with the tone of the scene they are playing over or following. The pilot is centered around a shady, all-pervasive corporation called Nascorp that could almost be a nascent version of Robocop's Omni consumer products. No killer robots here though, Nascorp is involved in this case in land development, that popular 80s trope, running private cancer clinics, graveyard maintenance, and yes, murder. From the first second of the episode we are straight into the action, there is no lengthy introduction to the main characters and instead we open with a woman named Shirley trying to visit her estranged grandmother in a Nascorp run cancer care clinic. Shirley quickly finds herself caught up in a complex scheme to steal her grandmother's valuable land. She's drugged and kidnapped by a doctor, kept sedated and held in the clinic as a patient, while the people who run the facility decide what to do with her. I can increase her dosage slowly. It'll take a few days, but at least there's not likely to be a problem with an autopsy. There won't be an autopsy. I don't like this. The old woman was dying anyway. We're all dying, Talwin. Some of us are just dying sooner than others. We meet our protagonist next, riding bikes. Richie's younger sister has followed him and his friends, and they tease her as they cycle down Mrs. Harrison's driveway. They are soon intercepted, though, by a NASCorp employee who informs them that Mrs. Harrison no longer lives there and that they are trespassing. It is at this point that Cheryl and her dog make a startling discovery, a human skull. Throughout this opening, you can clearly see the detective show roots of the series as producers and writers on display. A mystery is set up and it is up to our main characters to sort through the clues and uncover the truth. When Richie decides to involve his reporter friend Gallagher, we are introduced to Richie's computer, Ralph. Richie dials into the system of the LA Gazette to reach Gallagher. This scene makes some interesting connections between hackers and graffiti artists. Richie uses the handle Kilroy throughout the show. Kilroy, incidentally, was the World War II equivalent of the cool ass. This scene also includes a sort of disclaimer for the audience's benefit from Gallagher that he willingly gave Richie access to his system, although this alone was not enough to ward off the concerns of many TV critics at the time. It's okay, I gave him a password he could use. It is at this point that the plot starts to become clear to Richie and his friends. Nascorp had planned to kill Mrs. Harrison and gain control of her land, but the unexpected appearance of her previously presumed dead granddaughter, Shirley, created a problem that then had to be solved. I really like that Nascorp itself becomes a recurring character throughout the series, and the trope of evil corporations looking to scoop up land to create dystopian suburban developments is put to great use here. In solving the mystery of the skull, Richie uses his computer skills and works out that the skeleton discovered by his sister and her dog had been grave robbed by Nascorp from a corporate-run cemetery by finding graves of people at Matt Shirley's rough age when she went missing. Nascorp would then use this pilfered skeleton to prove that there were no living relatives to ensure there was no legal delays to grabbing Mrs. Harrison's land after her murder. Double-checking that the grave is definitely empty is a whole intense scene in and of itself. Oh, I completely forgot to mention the introduction of Alice Tyler as a character and her induction into the WizKids gang, which gives us this exchange, which is probably my favourite few lines of the entire show. What is all this stuff? Hey, it's Ralph. I built him. You're a real computer nerd, aren't you? Don't you know anything? I'm not a nerd, I'm a hacker. The first half of the episode is admittedly kind of light on hacking. Computers basically play the part of research aid, replacing the montage of a trip to the library to stare at microfiche that would have taken place if the show had been made in the 70s. The second half of Programmed for Murder is where we really get to see Richie's hacking abilities put to good use, and what I think are possibly the first time certain techniques had been shown in popular culture up to this point. Richie and Jeremy, through a series of twists and turns, wind up locked in the basement of a NASCORP facility, awaiting what will surely be a grisly fate. In order to escape, Richie finds a computer, plugs it in, and brute forces a password to gain access to NASCORP's environmental control systems. Is this one of the first times that brute forcing a password is shown in a movie or TV series? I think it must be. Well, how long is this going to take? I don't know. It could take days. Great. And we'll be dead. Notice, by the way, how often hackers trigger environmental control systems to confound their enemies and amuse their friends. You are probably thinking of the sprinkler scene in the movie Hackers, but it goes way beyond that. 
For example, it also happens in the 1998 TV series based on the movie The Net, which we will be covering in a future episode, enabling our heroine to sprinkle her way out of being held at gunpoint. I'd say, though, that the pinnacle of hackers versus building infrastructure, though, is the smart home hijack scene in Mr. Robot Season 2, which sadly does not involve a sprinkler. A missed opportunity, I feel. And the origin of the entire trope might well be deeply weird 70s AI Frankenstein movie, The Demon Seed. Regardless, Richie turns up the heat, activates the sprinklers and triggers a fire alarm, which results in an evacuation of the building and an eventual rescue by firemen, who seem to really want to abseil everywhere despite the plentiful stairs. <laughs> Finally, Shirley is rescued from the Nascorp clinic. The Nascorp executives are bundled into a police car and thus ends the pilot episode. Some historical tech context around the show. Microsoft Windows was announced in 1983. Microsoft also released the first version of Word that year. Apple released Lisa, the first commercial computer with a GUI around this time as well. On January 1st, 1983, known as Flag Day, TCP IP protocols became the standard for the ARPANET, replacing the earlier network control program. Also in 1983, ARPANET was divided into two parts, MILNET, to be used by the military and defense agencies, and a civilian version of ARPANET. The word internet was initially coined as an easy way to refer to the combination of these two networks, to their internetworking. Supposedly, the term hacker was first used by mainstream media on September 5th, 1983, when recently raided 414's hacking group member Neil Patrick appeared on the cover of Newsweek. Interestingly, the word hacker isn't uttered in the movie War Games, and early coverage of the 414s in the media referred to them as computer raiders. The 414s group had been active from 1982, breaking into systems at Los Alamos National Laboratory and Security Pacific National Bank, among others. There is a truly excellent short documentary on the group called The 414s, The Original Teenage Hackers, which I am going to link in the description of this video and highly recommend you check out. Watching the media coverage of the 414s after they were busted, you can feel the fear of parents who realize that their seemingly quiet, studious teenage kids could be national security risks from their bedrooms with just a computer and a modem. Many of the 414s members met in a scout program sponsored by IBM, with meetings taking place at IBM's Milwaukee office. The Milwaukee area code became their group name, 414. Another early hacker group, the Inner Circle, was also busted by the FBI in 1983 for hacking into government and military networks in the US and various big corporate email accounts. The group numbered over a dozen members, spread out over America. The simultaneous FBI raids to break up the group took place in nine different states. Expect a video on the Inner Circle from Hack History very soon. At a time when the US was well, well in the grip of Cold War paranoia, it makes sense that the fears surrounding groups like the 414s and the Inner Circle and the portrayal of hackers in the media around this time resulted in the first American computer fraud law relating to unauthorized access being included in the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. Ultimately, this all led to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, which is still ruining hackers' lives in the US with excessive sentencing for what often amounts to digital trespassing and vandalism. The year after WizKids and WarGames were released, there was the founding of hacking groups Cult of the Dead Cow, Legion of Doom, and the Hacker Zine 2600, one of the absolute original core novels of the entire cyberpunk genre Neuromancer by literary pioneer William Gibson was published in 1984. Finally, also in 1983, Fred Cohen, a University of Southern California graduate student, did a live demonstration of proof-of-concept code to bypass security mechanisms and take complete control of Unix systems with an infected program. This demonstration took place during a security seminar at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. Len Edelman coined the term virus to describe it in 1984. So in what other ways did hacking and tech feature in the show? A year before WizKids first aired, Tron had taken a shot at anthropomorphizing computer programs and starting a long tradition of trying to find a way to visually represent computing in a way that is potentially more engaging with viewers. WizKids doesn't really do this. Richie works on the command line for the most part, as this was just before the crest of GUI interfaces hit. While Ralph's abilities like facial recognition were mainly theoretical at the time, the show never fully crosses the line into sci-fi or outright technological fantasy. Episode 5 of WizKids, A Chip Off the Old Block, is an absolute standout in my opinion. The plot centers around Richie being accused of hacking into a bank and making off with a million dollars. Eventually it becomes clear that one of Richie's fellow students, Chip Patterson, get it? Chip Off the Old Block? was noticed illegally accessing the bank systems from the school library and transferring small amounts of money so they could buy a home PC. He was then framed for the larger theft. The real culprits of the million dollar robbery are the bank's own corrupt sysadmins. Come to think of it, the plot for this one kind of reminds me a little of Joey's story arc in Hackers the Movie. There's also a War Games reference in this episode, which feels like the writers playfully batting away the concerns over teen hackers voiced by TV and film critics of the time. How'd you get the number? Uh, I, I did it like in War Games. You know the movie? The second big standout episode for me is 10, The Network, which sees Richie tricked into accessing NSA systems by a shadowy hacker known only as The Wrench, after reading a mysterious post on his school's bulletin board system. 
This episode also sees Richie raided by the feds. Richie's family is very understanding, by the way. Surely his mother would permanently take his computer away at this point. And Richie entangled, along with his friends, in a national security mess involving the US and Soviet governments. Does this mean even the mighty Sussop is confused? No, it means your assistance operator has been presented with a challenge. A challenge Sussop will solve given little time. Episode 2 involves Richie unwittingly providing a prison inmate with the perfect scheme to escape by running through very rudimentary scenarios modeled after prison guard patrol routines and a weird sort of online game. Don't ask me how that works exactly. We also have Richie's mom answer the door to find a strange man her teenage son has been talking to on the computer outside, and she ushers him into the house. Probably don't do this. Well, hi, my name is Dave Kern. I'm a friend of Richie Adler's. Are you his mother? Yes, I'm Irene. So you're the famous Mr. Kern. Well, he told you about me? He certainly has. He said you're a terrific computer programmer. Deadly Access sees Richie hired by a chemical company systems administrator to test their security systems, only to stumble upon a secret plan to create and test a new kind of nerve toxin weapon. Logic bombs feature heavily in this episode, as this was just prior to the time the term virus in relation to computing was going to enter our language, and the way this particular logic bomb was to function almost reminds me of ransomware. In the world, it's a logic bomb. I programmed the computer to call Carl and me at certain intervals. The right code didn't enter before the countdown ends. The computer eats all its data, starting with the water project. Then it alerts every user. Made in the USA is a very 1980s violent revolution in South America episode, which includes audio bugs and Richie's father making a brief appearance while attending a telecommunications conference. This episode also sees the introduction of the Athena Society, a sort of national security related secret society run by a man called Carson Marsh and his absolutely incredible Batman Lair level secret computer. Towards the end of this episode, we also see a portable computer and printer used to transmit and produce hard copy of a suspect's photo, which must have seemed extremely high tech at the time. Meanwhile, in episode 6, entitled Airwave Anarchy, a very dapper dressed criminal kingpin intercepts and changes police dispatch messages from a camper van so he can pull off the perfect heists. My favourite part of this episode is probably the chaos that ensues when all on-duty cops are told to go for lunch at the same time, or maybe some of the dialogue associated with the weird little robot subplot. We are going to create an electronic life form. The 15th episode is a bit of an odd duck, involving aquariums, the apparent murder of a prominent marine biologist, and a plot to train dolphins to be communist spies in Cuba. The dolphin winds up communicating with Richie through, what else, a computer interface, and eventually Richie has to send a message to Ralph to try to let someone know he has been kidnapped along with the dolphin. And finally, whatever this is... I mentioned before that the pilot episode generated a lot of media controversy and necessitated some reworking of the premise of the show. I think there's little doubt that the raids and busts of teen hacker groups in the US in 1983 would have helped generate interest for the show, but TV critics were also extremely worried about hacking and the way it was portrayed as neutral or even good within the WizKids fictional world. I also already mentioned that the pilot episode was, I think, a purest distillation of what the show was intended to be, because after it aired, the writers were forced to cut back on the more madcap and legally questionable plot elements. Yes, the young actors are talented, clever and cute, but WizKids glorifies crime. It makes heroes of its young criminals. Its premise is rooted in the message that anybody's computer system is fair game so long as the end justifies the means, wrote Barbara Holsuppel of the Pittsburgh Press. Meanwhile, Marilyn Preston wrote in the Chicago Tribune, These cute kids illegally access and search their school's computer, the private files of the county clerk's office, and the computer system of a large newspaper in Los Angeles. Instead of appealing, the first episode of WizKids is appalling. And finally, Fred Rothenberg writing for the Associated Press, WizKids does not make a whimper on the sex and violence scale, yet it may be more dangerous to children than anything on television this season. Our adolescent heroes, sort of hardy boys high on silicone chips, engage willy-nilly in assorted illegal activities, computer tampering, driving without license, licenses and grave robbing, even though some of this lawbreaking may be construed as adolescent pranks and all of it is done in the name of crime fighting, none of it serves as TV role model behaviour. As I've said, from episode 2 onwards the show added a police detective and a reporter to try to tackle the issues these critics raised. In particular, the show tries to make a point of having Richie mention that he was legitimately given a password for a system or that he's hacking with an okay from responsible adults in positions of authority because the gravity of whatever situation they are in that week demands action. I'm unsure though how much these changes actually mollified outraged newspaper columnists of the time. The one and only series of WizKids was broadcast on ITV in the UK, in New Zealand on TVNZ, and also in Japan, where the title was changed to Microcomputers Big Operations, which is just a lovely name for a show. 
There is no official DVD release in English, so for this video I've had to rely on poor quality VHS rips and the French DVD release, which is really not very easy to find. Ultimately what killed the show was ratings, but I think it was also simultaneously too topical for TV critics and perhaps a little ahead of its time. It was moved from time slot to time slot by CBS, where it would struggle against baseball, the NBA, and rival networks more popular, well-established shows. WizKids is a fascinating look at what hackers look like in popular culture before the stereotypes and cliches became so rigidly codified, with a more thoughtful, technically accurate, and human humanizing view of hacking and nerdy high school kid life. The creators of the show have said that the plan was to follow the story of the kids right through high school and into college. I wish we'd gotten to see what another few seasons of the show would have looked like as the US hacking scene exploded and grew exponentially after the release of War Games. I wonder how the writers of WizKids would have tackled just how increasingly relevant the show's premise would have continued to be. I also wonder if the show had been more successful if it might have undone some of the negative connotations that grew up around hackers. After War Games and this show, personally, I feel like it wasn't until a decade later in 1992 and the movie Sneakers that we saw another really good depiction of hackers in pop culture culture, with three-dimensional characters and a measure of technical accuracy that went beyond what rapidly became tired stereotypes and computers as magical MacGuffins. Am I wrong about this? Please feel free to sound off in the comments. Also, you can find many of the episodes of WizKids right here on YouTube, and if you have some time, I heartily recommend giving them a look. Be warned though, the video quality is really not great. So what events in hacker history have we not covered yet that you think is vital? What hacker-related TV shows and movies can we simply not miss out on? The more obscure the better, hit the comments with some suggestions for future episodes. And if you want to help this channel grow, simply share the content with people you think might be interested. That's it. Thanks for watching and please subscribe so you can keep an eye out for future episodes.